o'clock this morning, we have. The stage was set for an explosive ALP state conference. John Robertson led the charge. Uh, the next amendment uh, stands in the name of, uh, of John Robertson and Matt Thistleway. Thank you, John. This proposal that you have before you from the government for privatisation does nothing to deal with the fundamental issues that lay at the heart of a Labor government. It does nothing to ensure the long-term employment of the workers engaged in the electricity industry in New South Wales. The government fought back. The Premier, the Premier, Premier made it clear this down. Thank you. This is about ego, it's about power, but not political power. This debate is about Robbo and Bernie trying to run the conference, trying to run the conference, trying to show who's Order. more important Order. than who. Delegates. Let history record that on this day, May 3rd, 2008, the New South Wales branch of this great party found its courage, rose above nostalgia and fear, and did what was right. Thank you. History records that Yemma's proposal was resoundingly defeated. Daily Telegraph journalist Simon Benson has spent the last four months researching a book into the downfall of Morris Yemma. There was a view and a decision made immediately after the conference uh, that Morris Yemma had to go. Um, Carl Batar, Mark Abib, Luke Foley, Bernie Reardon, all in agreement that Morris had to go one way or the other. The next day, Maurice Yemma announced that he was going to defy the decision of the conference. I'm uh, advising that we are proceeding down the path that the government had started to secure the state's energy supplies, to secure our economic future. Thank you. His decision outraged the union movement. This government has signed its political death warrant tonight. It was then that you saw the campaign really start up um, with the threats to MPs over the police election and the protection of MPs who were threatening across the floor. One of the union leaders on the party's administrative committee was the United Services Union's Ben Cruz. If a bill came before the lower house, did you encourage them or uh, to cross the floor to vote against privatisation? Well, clearly the campaign was to oppose oppose privatisation and indeed... So now, you wanted them to cross the floor and embarrass the Premier? It wasn't, wasn't about embarrassing anyone, it was about, about obtaining the right outcome. You were also a member of the Administrative Committee of the ALP, a That's very powerful right. committee. Yes, yes. Did you um, uh, threaten MPs with loss of pre-selection? No, if no. If in I... the event of it coming to a vote on the floor, that they would lose pre-selection if they didn't vote against it? Uh, no, we encouraged MPs to uh, to support the campaign against privatisation. One of the ways you might encourage and... them is to threaten them with pre-selection loss. Well, I, 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 I don't recall anything like that. What pressure did head office and the unions bring on MPs during the privatisation debate? A lot of pressure. I think there wasn't an MP that wasn't visited, that wasn't coerced, that they shouldn't vote for uh, the privatisation, they shouldn't vote for it in caucus, but yet they held. What was the nature of the coercion? Well, I don't know. I wasn't there at uh, any uh, particular meeting, but I could, I could, I could imagine that we, they were using personal relationships, uh, pre-selections. Pre-selections. Well, uh, it, it could be. It would be possible to to use that. What did you say to MPs who were threatened over their pre-selections? Uh, I didn't speak to them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, they were people that uh, were more inclined to listen uh, to their unions rather than be affected by the argument in caucus. These were dark days indeed for the Labor government. The party machine, led by Carl Batar, was at war with the Premier. Maurice Yemmer's circle of trusted advisers was shrinking daily. 
he decided to dump a number of ministers and juggled different names on his hit list. One of the ministers in his sights was right-wing power broker Joe Tripodi. It's pretty clear that, um, for one reason or another, uh, Joe Tripodi uh, decided that Morris was either going to go or had to go and uh, ensured his own political survival by um, doing a deal with uh, the power brokers. And what was that deal? Well, that he would remain in Cabinet. And how, how is he going to ensure that? Well, he could deliver support in the right-wing caucus to ensure Morris went. Did Joe Tripodi have a motive then in the demise of Morris Yemmer? Absolutely not. I mean, anyone that has very circulate in this doesn't know the facts. Joe Tripodi totally supported Morris Yemmer from the time he replaced Carr uh, until the time uh, Morris decided to resign. And uh, at every occasion in the seven caucus meetings that we had to approve the privatisation, we all supported Morris Yammer. Morris Yammer resigned because his faction wouldn't support him in his ticket. And you and Joe Tripodi were the controls of that faction. Would it not be fair to say that you and Joe Tripodi were part of the downfall of Morris Yammer? Absolutely wrong. We totally supported Morris. What Morris asked Caucus to do, Caucus could not uh, deliver. Caucus couldn't or wouldn't allow Yemmer to choose his own ministry. On the 5th of September last year, for the first time ever, New South Wales Labor forced its Premier to walk the plank. I took what I believe to be a package of renewal, reform and refreshment for the party, the Cabinet, uh, that was uh, not accepted, so uh, I tendered my resignation. I wasn't going to serve uh, as the head of a cabinet that uh, uh, was being foisted on me. Yes, of course. Uh, as you will know, as you will know, Morris Emma resigned as Premier today. The new Premier was Nathan Rees. I pledge my loyalty to Australia and to the people of New South Wales. Immediately, he sought the help of Party Secretary Carl Batar to divvy up the spoils. Do you think it sends the wrong message to people, though, that uh, Carl Batar has been the one divvying up with you who gets what? Well, the alternative to that was me dealing directly with all the people who had their hand up, and uh, that was going that was just a, a uh, that was going to be a nightmare. So I didn't do that, and uh, I, I I chose to use the General Secretary uh, for that negotiation. The first um, political mistake. That Nathan Rees made on becoming leader was to admit that Carbatar helped choose his cabinet. I mean, sort of gave the game away, really, as to who was involved in his ascendancy. I declare that John Cameron Robertson is elected as a member of the Legislative Council to fill the. One month later, Union's New South Wales boss, John Robertson, walked straight into Parliament without facing an election and soon after became a minister. You only have to look at uh, uh, those who really benefit out of the, uh, the carve-up in the end. I mean, John Robertson's now minister in the Rees government, um, minister for energy, no less. We invited a number of New South Wales ALP figures to be interviewed by this program. Among them, Maurice Yemmer, John Robertson, Joe Tripodi, Bernie Reardon, Mark Arbib, and Carl Batar and Luke Foley from head office. Hello. All declined. Bathroom, by the way. Two provided brief okay. statements on the record. ALP President watching? Bernie Reardon that he was not aware of any plan to destabilise Premier Yemmer and Minister yeah. Joe Tripodi that he did not the... do a deal with head office prior no, to Yemmer's demise. For Nathan Rees, the big problem was the one that faced his predecessors, public transport and how to pay for it. Congestion was now costing the state $12 million a day. He needed to act. Can you put a percentage on the mental processes that, that, that transport demands from you as a Premier each day? I mean, out of... Out of 100% of your day, how much do you think about it? Two-thirds, the rest of the day. Uh, right. Health. Right.
Irish in Dutch chapter. Yeah. There's no doubt that uh, so not having been, sold the this is uh, life from last year, uh, so it had to change which. the plan of what government yeah. was from last year, so as far as its infrastructure like uh, plan was. Once we lost that argument, once uh, we weren't getting that sort of money coming through the Treasury coffers, uh, uh, plans had to change. And uh, uh, yes, uh, the North uh, West uh, rail line was uh, cancelled out. Having dumped Maurice Yemmer's North West Metro, Reese set his sights on getting federal funding for a more modest plan. On the 24th of October, in a meeting room high up on the 41st floor of Governor Macquarie Tower, the Premier met with officials from Infrastructure Australia to pitch his new plan, the CBD Metro. It would be a six kilometre tunnel under the city from Central Station, up through the CBD, under Sydney Harbour at two points, and into a marginal labour seat in the inner west, areas already well served by train, bus, light rail and ferry. Premier Rees hadn't taken the plan to Cabinet. It hadn't even been fully costed. When the Premier finished his presentation to Infrastructure Australia, he left the room with his infrastructure advisor, David Richmond, and held a press conference. David, Richmond and I have just come from briefing Infrastructure Australia's representatives who are here in Sydney today to hear about our bid for federal government funds for infrastructure projects in Sydney and New South Wales. Now, journalists were handed a map of the Metro and a press release. David, what, what proportion of Commonwealth funding is seeing? For this, uh, in the first instance, my understanding is we'd be seeking the travel. Uh, do we have the uh, do we have the plan, the, the map? Okay, mm -hmm. I might have the map handed out, um, and if I could have one, so I can talk to it. How much would this cost? Costing on this one? Uh, <coughs> we're still working through the costing right at the moment. It's an option that's emerged in the context of the mini budget and finalising the Infrastructure Australia uh, submission. I, I wouldn't give you a figure today. We, I, we can organise to give you a figure in an hour or so. Four Corners has been told that when no one could answer the simple question, how much would it cost, an advisor was dispatched back to the room where discussions with Infrastructure Australia were still going on. He asked, any idea what this will cost? The reply came back, about four billion. Later that afternoon, the Premier issued a press release. The CBD Metro would cost $4 billion. When they learned of the plan, some experts had concerns. It's not really tackling the problems in the outer suburbs, which are really much more serious than the problems for inner city uh, commuters. Inner city commuters face the problem of a lack of capacity on the rail system and on the buses. Uh, but the, in the outer suburbs, the problem is there's just no systems at all. There are no trains at all in some of these suburbs. The federal government wasn't impressed either. The project wasn't part of a comprehensive transport plan. It wouldn't be funded. Infrastructure Australia spokesman Michael Deegan. There was a view, was there, that New South Wales didn't have an overarching strategy for dealing with the problems that it faced with? That's correct. So the Prime Minister had to tell the New South Wales government how to get its act together? It was a collaborative discussion. This was how do we work together to address the issues that our biggest city is struggling with, with population growth. It was then Premier Rees decided, with or without a transport plan for the whole city, New South Wales taxpayers would pay for the CBD Metro instead. Did the state government decide not to seek funding from Infrastructure Australia? Because Infrastructure Australia had said, we're not gonna fund it, New it's South no good. The New South Wales government, in its mini budget process, provided the funding for Metro Stage 1. I know, but that's not the answer to my question with respect, Minister. My question is, did the government decide not to seek funding from Infrastructure Australia because you had been forewarned that the project wouldn't be funded? No. The Metro is winning few supporters, least of all people who live at the end of the proposed Metro line in Roselle. That station is slated to be built here under the club premises of NRL team West's Tigers. A deal has been